Hello and welcome to Encore. Coming up on today's photography special. Giving front page stories a human face, we head to Perpignan to meet the photojournalists at the Visa Polimage Festival. Sketching a picture of Exodus from Syria, photojournalist Magnus Wenman's been applauded at the event for his use of digital media to cover the news. And a life in pictures. Marc Ribot has died at 93 years old. We go th through some of the tributes to this most poetic of photographers. <laughs> Capturing world events with a click of the shutter. In a world of visual storytelling, photojournalism is key. In the French town of Perpignan, Visa Polimage brings together photographers from across the globe. The Catalan city is hosting the festival for the 28th year running. I went to meet the photographers covering Europe's migrant crisis and talked to them about the power of pictures in the digital era. They say a picture is worth a thousand words and never more so than when it's on the front of a newspaper. The photographers taking these photographs are at Visa Pour Limage, where they come out from behind their cameras. The festival here in Perpignan is an annual opportunity to see the very best in international photojournalism. This year, one story has been in the headlines continuously and given rise to some heartbreaking images the plight of refugees arriving in Europe. At the festival, a number of exhibitions are dedicated solely to this issue. Yanis Berakis has been documenting the humanitarian crisis at the edge of the European Union. It was an amazing experience because, especially at the beginning, I found myself alone on the, you know, the beach, in, sometimes in Lesbos or in Kors. And people were coming out from the boats, coming straight to me. Sometimes they would surrender to me, thinking I'm uh, some kind of policeman or a Coast Guard officer. Sometimes I would give them a small sweet, which is like a traditional Greek treat. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, you see them smiling and changing. They would hug me, high fives, selfies, jumping up and down, happy. So it was a fantastic experience. And with photographs like these, you're providing a journalistic service, but how do you think about the aesthetic aspect of the photo? How much thought goes into the beauty of a photo like this when you're framing it? When you have a boring picture or a picture that has no real power, the, you know, the guy in Japan or in the States, thousands of kilometers away, is going to turn the page. When you have a strong beautiful in whatever context, picture, this person is going to stay at the picture and read the picture and get the message. So that's important for me. Once these treacherous journeys have been made, safety is often still elusive for many refugees. Marie Dorigny spent months photographing the women caught up in these dangerous cross-continental migrations. They lose their homes, they're thrust into the road with their kids, they can be pregnant, they find themselves among thousands of men, which is an enormous culture shock for them. They're put on boats and they've never seen the sea and obviously they don't know how to swim. It's a hugely traumatic experience. Imagine you yourself tomorrow morning being forced from your home with your kids in your arms and a bag full of stuff you've managed to pack at the last minute. I'd like everyone to imagine themselves in this situation and then they might be a bit more compassionate. These images give us an insight into realities far removed from the comfort of Western Europe, but publishing the evidence of this despair is a sensitive issue. Be it a photo of a refugee in distress or the atrocities of war, how to illustrate these stories is the subject of serious debate in the media. Recently there's been a lot of debate in newsrooms about what it's ethical or respectful to publish in terms of very sensitive images. What's your opinion on that? 
I don't mind showing violent images when the violence has some meaning. However, there are levels of brutality that are not necessary to show and could even be rejected by our readers. And indeed, some people say that by publishing images of terrorists or from terrorist organizations, in some way we're complicit, we're giving them coverage. What is your opinion on this? Is it really a war of images? For us, the debate is really about when we're looking at something important, which is new, that we haven't already seen, that tells us something about the nature of the conflict. The crucial part of our job is to put that into context. First, to say where it comes from, not to lie to people. That is, OK, we're publishing this photo, but it comes from the Syrian government press agency, or from the rebels. I must admit we don't publish much from the Islamic State group. The only journalistic approach we can take is that one, to provide context to explain to people why we're showing them this. Images tell one side of the story, but the complex reasons behind these waves of migration are impossible to capture in a single snap. The rise of the Islamic State group has forced many to flee their homes in the Middle East. Frédéric Lafargue was in Kurdistan to bear witness. These are civilians, local people who are Sunni Muslims. They're actually three cousins, if I remember correctly, who are fleeing from the area controlled by the Islamic State group. They've just been subjected to the Kurdish military security protocol. That is, they have to come forward following a laser beam. And in the case of the males, they have to undress and show themselves with their hands in the air. And so these young men were suspected of being part of the Islamic State group? Indeed, one of them had been flagged up by one of the Peshmerga's sources in the Islamic State group held territory. They believed that he was potentially a sympathizer of the Islamic State group or at least having contacts with the extremist Islamist movement. I think that in this series of photos, I took great care to maintain some element of humanity, even when photographing those who appear to us as monsters, who are monsters objectively. It's a singular approach, bringing humanity to the world's major conflicts and showing the human face of those behind the violence and of their victims. Visa pour l'image is also an opportunity for those in the profession to see the work of their peers. And of course, there are prizes for those outstanding in their fields. The Visa Prize for Innovation in Digital Media this year went to Magnus Wenman for a report called Fatima's Drawings. The photojournalist followed a young Syrian refugee and documented her adaptation to a new life in Sweden. Let's take a look. His admirers said he wrote poetry with his pictures. French photographer Marc Ribou has died aged 93 in Paris. Ribou was known for finding beauty even in the hard news stories he covered. We take a look back at a life behind the camera. The photo would become iconic overnight. A young American girl holding a flower up to a gun at a protest against the Vietnam War in Washington, D.C. The flower girl helped shift public opinion against the war. It also made its author, French photographer Marc Ribou, a household name. She was saying to them, but I'm not hurting you, so you won't hurt me. We're the same age. We're not going to hit each other. It was fantastic, actually, what she was saying, straight from her heart, with just a flower. Born in Lyon in 1923, he took his first picture at the age of 14 with the camera his dad had used in the First World War. He got his big break at 29, when Robert Kappa, 
and Henri Cartier-Bresson invited him to join the prestigious photo agency Magnum. A year later, he climbed the Eiffel Tower and took a picture that would become an instant classic. The key to that photo's success, like many of his others, was his understanding of geometry. Form. These forms have no angle, no right angles, no sharp angles. It's all curves, you see. It really makes the photo. His career took him to the front line of events around the world, from the Algerian War of Independence to China under Chairman Mao. A man devoted to his art, Ribu once said he wanted to photograph life at its most intense, as intensely as possible. Marc Ribou currently has a collection of photos on show at the Visa Pour l'Image Festival. The black and white series taken in Cuba in 1963 depicts a country energized by a young Fidel Castro. And Ribou also managed to get some iconic shots of the Cuban leader while he was there. For many photojournalists at the annual event, Ribou was a reference and an inspiration. A great man has passed away, but he left lots of beautiful photos, so he'll always be with us. He saw a good and beautiful world, and like lots of Frenchmen, he liked taking photos of pretty women. It was a big part of my youth. <laughs> That's for sure. It was the era of hope without limits. We're finishing off with some rising talent from the world of photojournalism with pictures from the Visa Pour l'Image Fringe Festival, or The Off. These young photographers have found inspiration in Asia for this series of photos. Remember to check out our website. You can also fo follow Encore on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Visited, presented by Stuart Norville. Because they were young, because they were women, they were kidnapped, tortured, and raped. Since the 1990s, hundreds of women have been found dead in Ciudad Juarez, their bodies horribly mutilated. A prostitution ring, a serial killer, and countless other theories have been suggested. Despite all the investigations, the mystery of the dead women has never been solved. France Van Cat follows the struggle by the mothers of the victims who want to obtain justice for their murdered daughters. Revisited on France 24 and France